This series was produced by Fitzgerald Publishing, an independent black owned company and subsequent titles were published between 1966 and 1976. They featured additional historical black figures such as Harriet Tubman, Crispus Attucks and Benjamin Banneker. Company owner Bertram Fitzgerald was inspired to create this educational series because he was disappointed with the lack of positive black figures in the stories he read as a young child. He often used the classics illustrated comic books that were published between 1941 and 1969 as examples. He was even more motivated when he learned that the African heritage of authors such as Alexander Pushkin and Alexandre Dumas had been completely omitted in the short biographies included in these books. But this slide provides a high level summarized view of the timeline for these books. At first, Fitzgerald struggled to sell them. He experienced discrimination from bank lenders, shady accounting by commission men who stole his profits, and rejection from investors who believed that no one would be interested in educational comic books about historical black figures. But he eventually found success through partnerships with Coca-Cola, Exxon, McDonald's, a and and several others. These sponsorships led to distributions at schools, the NAACP, the National Urban League, the Reading is Fundamental program and several other sites. He went on to sell more than 9 million copies by 1976. Even though they're not as popular today, more than 25 million total copies have been sold and are still available on their website. His accomplishments were formally recognized in 2005 when he received the Pioneer Award at a Glyph Comics Award Ceremony. The Glyph Comics Award Ceremony is an annual event that recognizes the best in comics made by, for, and about people of color. Today, many adult Americans remember these comics fondly, and the Golden Legacy series is regularly recognized at annual Black comic book festivals across the country. The Golden Legacy series is a foundational forerunner for much of today's comic books about Black historical figures, such as MLK, Malcolm X, Nat Turner, and more recently, the late John Lewis in the March trilogy. It's fitting that the Golden Legacy series begins with a volume about the Haitian Revolution because there were multiple revolutions prior to 1791. However, the Haitian Revolution was the first successful rebellion organized by enslaved Africans in the Americas who went on to rule their own independent nation. Likewise, the Golden Legacy series represented a breakthrough as the most, um, the most successful American publisher of comic books geared toward a black audience. The comic book Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story had been published a decade earlier, but the Golden Legacy series was the first to prove that publishers could find continued success with educational comic books about historical black figures. The Golden Legacy's comic book about the saga of Toussaint Louverture and the birth of Haiti is even more significant because it was the only 20th century American comic book length story published about the Haitian Revolution. Recently, many more comic books have been produced about the Haitian Revolution and more are in development. So this led me to the question, how does the content in this comic book, the saga, of two, the saga of Toussaint Louverture and the birth of Haiti, how does it compare to the content found in other media about the Haitian Revolution? And is this comic book an accurate depiction? Is it historical fiction? Why is it the only 20th century American comic book on the topic? And then also, is there anything about its retelling in comic book form that makes it stand out from the narratives told in other mediums? So let's start with a look at other media that have been published about the Haitian Revolution. The earliest media examples include content that was created while the revolution was taking place. Baylor University history professor Ronald Angelo Johnson's 2019 article details much of this work. For example, Louverture himself crafted responses to negative stories that were being told about the Africans on the island. His responses came in the form of PR campaigns throughout Europe and much of the Americas. Johnson's article also discusses how a small number of US newspapers, such as the New York Evening Post, wrote positively about the Haitian Revolution. But these writings were dwarfed by the large number of negative reports written about the rebellion in other papers. 
Interestingly, English poet Williams Wordsworth had also composed a sonnet that he dedicated to Louverture. And in it, he characterizes Louverture as a hero and describes Napoleon as a tyrant. Additional examples include personal journals from individuals in Jamaica and in the US who praised Louverture during the war and mourned his death after he was captured and died in a French prison. The number of history books on the topic began to be published soon after the war ended and more continue to be published today. This is a small sampling. And this slide includes some examples of historical fiction that were inspired by the revolution. In 1938, 21 year old Jacob Lawrence had completed his series, The Life of Toussaint Louverture. This series of 41 paintings was later adapted into a children's book by author Walter Dean Myers in 1996. Last year, in two, last year in 2019, these paintings were showcased at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento. The Haitian Revolution has also been the subject of several plays, multiple documentaries, a movie and a 1979 cartoon titled Black Dawn. It's even made its way into the world of video games with at least two titles that focus on the events that led to Haiti's independence. And these are screenshots from the Age of Empires three video game. This is another screenshot from the same game. And these images here were taken from Assassin's Creed three liberation, a more recent game. So I'll also share visuals from some of the comics I mentioned earlier. This is an early example of a short story from, from 1941. It was titled The Story of Tyranny, but the main character was a young white boy. And in it, Haitian revolutionaries were briefly featured alongside many other historical figures from other revolutions throughout history. The comic that we'll be discussing today was published in 1966 during the Silver Age of Comics. These are some screensh screenshots from the book. This weekly Mexican comic book series, Fuego, was initially launched in 1970. It was, it's a fictional story about the Haitian revolutionary Henri Christophe, who later went on to become the king of Northern Haiti. And in the 80s, this comic book was reprinted and sold throughout much of Latin America. Toussaint Louverture has also been the subject of several comics published in France. Two of the most popular comics are shown here, and they both refer to him as the Black Napoleon. The comic on the left, Drums of Freedom, was produced in 2015 by Guyanese artist Barrington Brathwaite. And in his 2017 article, Charles Forsdick, a professor of modern languages and cultures at the University of Liverpool, explained that this comic book offers a sweep of Haitian history beginning with Columbus's arrival and the Haitian Maroon Francois Macandal's 18th century rebellion before shifting to a detailed account of the revolution. The comic book page on the right was published in 2016 and it briefly features the Haitian revolutionary Dutty Bookman. It's from a comic book that's associated with the Assassin's Creed III liberation video game I shared earlier. Digital comics about the Haitian revolution have also been pro produced. In 2018, the comic on the left was published on the comics website, thenib.com. And on the right, the New Internationalist magazine published their own online comic in 2019 about the Haitian revolution. It's available on their website at newint.org. So during my research, I found multiple sources that engaged in reviews and analyses of many texts and artwork about the Haitian Revolution. And as with many other historical events, there are different perspectives about what occurred in the past. But much of the research suggests that the Haitian Revolution is portrayed as either an African achievement or as an unlucky series of events that took the French empire by surprise. So Haitian anthropologist, Michel Wolf Touillot, was an excellent source of information in my research on this topic. In his 1995 book, Silencing the Past, 
It describes two types of formulas of erasure that are used in anti-African perspectives about the Haitian Revolution. So Tuyo, he explains that the first formula of erasure is often used by generalists, such as textbook authors. These individuals often erase the fact that something happened by excluding it. And a second type of formula of erasure can come from specialists who are experts on the topic. Like they might acknowledge that something occurred, but some will trivialize it and remove the fact the facts that don't fit their agenda. Some additional examples where this occurs beyond the Haitian Revolution are with slavery in America or with the Holocaust. So when trivializing slavery, some common statements include it wasn't that bad or that slavery also happened to non-Blacks. And with the Holocaust, similar attempts might include phrases such as it didn't really happen or that the Germans didn't really build gas chambers. When discussing the Haitian Revolution, and the silencing that has occurred around this topic, a 2005 article by German anthropologist Thomas, Thomas Reinhardt describes three trivializing tropes. These trivializing tropes are used by writers with anti-African stances. And number one, the first thing they'll, they'll, they'll mention is that they'll argue for an exceptional Louvetier. They'll say that he acts like a European and succeeds as a European. And they believe these are the sole reasons for his success. Number two, they'll blame bad weather, mean bugs, and competing European powers for the losses that France experienced. They'll claim that the African revolutionaries didn't have the intelligence needed to defeat Napoleon. And the third trope is they'll portray Africans as barbarians who revert to their savage state in the absence of white control. This is driven by their belief in the superiority of European peoples and powers. So after considering these perspectives about the trivializing tropes and the question I shared earlier, I decided to investigate the context surrounding the production and distribution of the comic. And I'll share some of those details now. So the saga of Toussaint Louverture and the birth of Haiti was published in 1966 during the latter years of the US's civil rights movement. Brown versus the Board of Ed had initiated the integration of public schools Nonviolent protests such as sit-ins, bus boycotts, freedom rides, and marches were common across the country at this time. And city riots were also erupting across the country in response to the instances of police brutality and the murders of unarmed Black people. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had also been founded in Oakland, California that same year, in 1966. In 1966, the nation was also mourning the assassinations of multiple individuals. By this time, we had lost Medgar Evers, JFK, and Malcolm X. Leo Carty, the artist and author of the saga of Toussaint Louverture and the birth of Haiti was an activist, and he regarded his artwork as part of the many active efforts to promote racial equality in the US during the civil rights movement. He served as an official illustrator for the Liberator magazine, the self-described voice of the Afro-American protest movement in the United States and the liberation movement of Africa. St. Louis University history professor Christopher M. Tinson's 2017 book, Radical Intellect, provides details about the many writers, editors, artists, and activists who contributed to the works published in this periodical. This slide shows an example of the content that could be found in one of the issues from this magazine. The highlighted header here is where the self-description as the voice of the Afro-American protest movement can be found. On this same page, we can see that one of the articles in this issue is an exclusive 1964 interview with the late John Lewis when he was the chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. We look to the right. We also see that James Baldwin and Ossie Davis both served on the magazine's advisory board. Before Cardi's work with the Liberator, he met Fitzgerald in the Air Force where they had both served in the Korean War. Several years after they completed their military service, they teamed up and decided that working on a comic book would be the best mode of delivery for black history facts because they also wanted children to be interested in the content. However, the one obstacle 
to their approach or, or one of the main obstacles to their approach was the social stigma against comic books. At this time, German American psychologist Frederick Wortham had succeeded in convincing parents, educators and politicians that comic books were negative influences on children's development. So in an effort to avoid these negative associations with comics, Fitzgerald and Cardi referred to the Golden Legacy volumes as magazines. So now that we've briefly established the context surrounding the production and release of the comic, I'd like to demonstrate how this book pushes back against the trivializing tropes that are often used in anti-African perspectives about the Haitian Revolution. So first, I'd like to remind us all again of the three trivializing tropes I discussed earlier. So number one, there's the belief that Louverture was acting and succeeding on European terms. Number two, some authors argued that the formerly enslaved Africans were not skilled enough to defeat, defeat Napoleon in war. And number three, it's believed that African-led nations face hardships because they're barbaric. So however, like many other pro-African authors who had studied the Haitian Revolution and the many sources that existed from that time period, Cardi's comic book pushes back on the tropes by accentuating the African influences on Louverture's formative years that contributed to his success. Number two, by demonstrating the strategic decisions and actions made by Africans that led to their victories. Number three, by pushing back on the depiction of Africans as savage barbarians who were inferior to whites. So when describing the first trivializing trope, Reinhardt writes that many texts concentrate on isolated persons or events and empty them of their revolutionary content. In relation to Louverture, he writes that it's exactly the practice of presenting Toussaint as so outstanding a black person that obliterates the fact that he was black. And in most biographies, he acts like a European and succeeds as a European. When Louverture is referred to as the Black Napoleon in these French comic books, I believe it serves this purpose by suggesting that his goals are inspired by Napoleon's aspirations. And in a 2014 interview, Donna Gere, the author of the comic book on the right, argued that his use of, of Black Napoleon in, in, the, in his graphic novel subtitle is justified because both men aspire to be rulers for life. But I argue that this reasoning ignores Louverture's revolutionary goals. Napoleon wanted to subjugate people while Louverture wanted to free the enslaved. Cardi was a professionally trained artist and he recognized the importance of the arts and aesthetics as well as the importance of visual representations of different groups in the media. But he also considered the socio-cultural impact of narratives, images and art instruction on comic book consumers. Art education that centers white and European standards in conceptual and artistic development add to the problems of erasure and visual media. Cardi recognized this impediment in his own education. And in a 1968 interview with WNYC, he stated that he went to very good art schools and was educated just like the white artists would be educated. Then came the day when I looked for my own image and I had none because all my values were white values as far as beauty and importance. I had no black image, no black values of myself. In this same interview, he also stated that he believed blacks had been psychologically brainwashed into viewing themselves as inferior and that one of the things that have to be repaired, one of the scars that have to be removed is the black man's image of himself. Cardi believed that this could be achieved through positive depictions of black people in visual mediums. Likewise, Fitzgerald recognized the erasure of black contributions and the omission of African identities in his own media experiences. And in a 2011 interview in the Back Issue magazine, Fitzgerald reminds us again that he was motivated to launch Golden Legacy so that kids could explore the world of African-American history at a time when such topics were virtually ignored in classrooms, much less comic books. Fitzgerald also stated in this interview that he specifically sought help from Cardi because he had full knowledge of Louverture. 
Cardi was extra motivated to write and illustrate the comic book in an attempt to reach the young black children of America with an accurate record of their history, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. He also stated that as a young boy, Louverture was one of his heroes. And heroes is something that young black kids really need today. His desire to provide black kids with a hero makes the comic book format even more significant because this was the domain of superheroes. In his 2006 book, Superhero, The Secret Origins of Genre, of a genre, Peter Coogan wrote, superheroes stand as metaphors for freedom, freedom to act without consequences and the freedom from the restrictions of gravity, the law, families, and romantic relationships. But by 1966, every mainstream comic book superhero had been white. The first mainstream black superhero, Black Panther, was introduced that year in 1966. And interestingly, as I mentioned earlier, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense had also been founded that same year in Oakland. Once again, like I mentioned before, the freedom that they had at this time, the freedom to act without consequences and the freedom from the restrictions of gravity, the law, families and romantic relationships were only reserved for white superheroes before 1966. In a 1962 essay published four years before the saga of Toussaint Louverture would be published, Italian scholar, philosopher and cultural critic, Umberto Eco wrote that each of these heroes is gifted with such powers that he could take over the government, defeat the army or alter the equilibrium of planetary politics. Although these stories were all fictional, comic book publishers were still wary about the idea of powerful black superheroes. In his 2014 book, Michigan State University history professor Julian Shambliss explores the reasons for this. He wrote, when black superheroes who had American backgrounds finally appeared in the 1960s and early 1970s in response to the interrelated rise of the black power movement and the black exploitation film fad, comic book writers struggled to create characters that seem authentically African-American and non-threatening to white audiences. With this understanding, I argue that Louverture as a comic book hero in 1966 was a metaphor for freedom from oppression and erasure. His successes in a comic book would have appeared impossibly heroic because African achievements and black heroes were excluded from textbooks and mainstream comics. So I'll focus the rest of our time on how this comic book pushes back on the first trope. Very early in the story, Carty immediately solidifies Louverture's origins. He highlights the roles played by two African men during Toussaint's formative years. That's Louverture's father and his godfather. So on this screen, we can see screenshots from panels from the beginning of the story. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we see multiple Africans exiting a ship. And in the second panel, the caption reads, Toussaint's father, an African of royal blood was captured in warfare and sold into slavery. But this is partially similar to Henri Christophe's origin story in the 1970s Mexican comic book Fuego. As I mentioned earlier, this weekly comic book's first 192 issues focused on the Haitian revolutionary Henri Christophe. In his 2008 article, Middlebury professor of Hispanic visual culture Enrique Garcia explains that Christophe's parents are portrayed as monarchs of African and Arab origin. However, Fuego's claims concerning Christophe's ancestry have no historical basis, and Garcia informs us that it was inspired by a desire to tell Hispanic audiences that this version of Christophe is not completely African. But Louverture's regal African lineage is supported in history books, and it plays a central role in the saga of Toussaint Louverture and the birth of Haiti's narrative. As the story continues, Readers learned that Toussaint's father's life was not as difficult as that of other enslaved people. This allowed him to instruct his son about their ancestral ways. And the caption in this panel states that his father taught him the use of herbs, African medicine, which had been passed on to him by his father. 
Young Toussaint is also educated by his godfather, Pierre Baptiste. Baptiste introduces him to books that inspire his revolutionary spirit. Cardi visually communicates this in one panel by placing Baptiste in the background as Louverture reads. And the caption for this panel states, about this time, Toussaint came across a book by Abbe Renal that had a profound effect on him. The Abbe's book spoke of the suppressed power of the blacks that needed just one thing to set it in motion. A courageous chief is wanted. Where is he? And in response to this, Louverture says to Baptiste, where is the leader? For some reason that stays with me all the time, Papa Pierre. And in the last two panels, Cardi makes sure that the reader understands that these two men had a role in Louverture's development by showing Baptiste speaking to Toussaint's father. Here we can see him say, mon ami, I think our task is done. His destiny calls him, he hears, but does not yet understand. As Louverture ages, he gains the respect of blacks and whites. And the caption in this panel reads, Toussaint became the head of the entire livery, had a wife, a home, and two sons. His position was held by only white men on the other plantations in the midst of the turmoil in San Domingo. And San Domingo was the, the name of the colony at the time. Toussaint lived the quiet life of a country gentleman, although still a slave. This comic book about Louverture's life acknowledges the roles that whites played in his life, but its primary purpose is to ensure that his African allegiances, origins, and influences are recognized. Louverture's allegiances to the Africans are revealed by his growing discontent while on the sidelines of the revolution. These panels show that the enslaved and the runaway Maroons were fighting back way before Louverture joined the war. Cardi shows how Louverture was bothered by this through an illustrated scene between him and his wife. She asks him, what is it, my husband? What is troubling you? And he responds, here I am safe and secure while my brothers take to the hills to fight for our freedom. We too are slaves, my love, my place is with them. Unfortunately, this is the only instance where an African woman contributes to Cardi's narrative and their contributions to the rebellion are regret regrettably absent in this comic. Yet this moment is significant because Louverture had a family, unlike most comic book superheroes, Peter Coogan refers to as unmarried adult orphans. Louverture was a real person. He was mortal and would die in a French prison alone. He wasn't a fictional superhero with the freedom to act without consequences. His decision to join the revolution uprooted his family and without superpowers to rely on in this comic book, Louverture's loyalty to the Africans could be viewed as heroic by readers, particularly the black target audience who may especially appreciate his fealty to the rebels. So thank you again to everyone for taking the time to join me and learning more about my research on this topic. Uh, I'll stop now so we can take some questions. There goes your walkout sound right now. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Darnell, and, and really want to um, thank you for joining us and, and, and sharing your work with us. I'd like to open it up now for some questions. You can either unmute now or raise your hand. And I will call on you. Sydney, go ahead. And then Audrey. Uh, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, and it was great to listen to. Uh, I had a question about you had this moment where you talked on erasure and kind of like this um, distinction between generalized erasure and this kind of specialist. And I wonder if you could talk about whether you think one of those is more significant or more problematic than the other, or whether they're both equally um, as problematic or combined together. So I, I think it's complicated because uh, there are instances where um, generalists they're not experts on the topic, right? 
and they're just trying to spread. So some people, especially textbook authors, they may go in with just a desire to be educators, right? They just want to teach. And they're not going to know the details about, you know, every single thing, especially if they're, they're, their objective is to cover two centuries of work, right? So they're just going to go to the information they have, and they're going to translate it, right, for the audience that they're trying to present it for. So um, I think maybe, yeah, maybe it is, maybe it is more dangerous coming from specialists because they really know what they're doing. They really know what they're doing. Like they're the experts, right? Like with many of you who are who are students um, getting your PhDs, um, you're going to be considered experts in whatever it is that you study, right? You're going to continue to keep learning. So if get a PhD, so much more learn. Everything, even on about the topic that they're experts in. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I thought I had I had a problem. So yeah, maybe I would say. Those who purposely choose to exclude because they want to push their own agenda, they're probably the ones that, that I think that's probably even worse because when you have a textbook and you're reading something, if something is left out, sometimes it's for reasons like um, because there's not enough pages and then whatever's prioritized is prioritized, which is also a concern when you prioritize certain things over others. How did you come up with that decision about what to prioritize above the others? But when you're the expert, um you made a choice right what to include and I'll, i guess i'll just stop with um i can appreciate textbooks because they can introduce us to so many so many topics at the same time and then if there's something that we really want to know that's when we're going to go to the experts and the specialists and that's when if we're going to the primary source we need them to be completely as com as honest as possible and really share as much as they can and allow us to also have the potential to become the, the future experts, right? Thank you. Thank you. Audrey, you had your hand up and next is Alfred. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. You had mentioned that women weren't um, like a big feature, but it was very significant at the very end, like when they were um, included in terms of the importance of family. And I'm wondering if you could just speak more broadly, since I think I'm probably like one of your grad students who has never read a comic or a graphic novel in a class before. So this has been really interesting for me um, about Black women in general in like the larger context of um, comics and graphic novels. Okay. I think um, just like society in general, Black women are not, they're not presented as uh, you know, people who play a, a huge role in society, right? Like they're not seen in the leadership positions. There's so many things that are happening behind the scenes. Uh, if I think specifically about the Haitian Revolution from a young age, uh, I grew up knowing about the Haitian Revolution and, and not being, I wasn't an expert about the Haitian Revolution, but I learned bits and pieces over time, right? But I was, I don't remember learning about women being a part of the Haitian Revolution until later on. Right, because more individuals, um, mainly women, started to speak up about the fact that these were missing. I remember first hearing about it when I was an undergrad in, uh, in Philly, um, and that made me interested. Um, so if I speak specifically about the Haitian Revolution and what was missing from the comic book, it's uh, the roles that they played in the war. Many of the women who fought, many of the people who were in the, in the military were women. It wasn't just men that were in the military. Uh, it's kind of like the, with the Black Panthers. So many women played a big role in the Black Panthers, but who was in the leadership positions? You see men all the time, right? Um, I think, you know, things are changing a little bit. You see the three women who are in charge of the Black Lives Matters movement or who were the founders, you know, but um, I didn't know that they were necessarily the founders. I remember hearing about um, two men. I, I can't remember their names right now. It's funny. So I guess it's a good thing that I can't, <laughs> but I remember Alicia Garza more than I remember the, the two men that I kept on seeing were the leaders of the Black Lives Movement. Um, so I hope that, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that was helpful, thank you. Thank you for the question. So I have a question, particularly in relation to, we're, we're talking about how this was presented in the medium of comic books and 
comics, particularly in the 60s, were because of the medium, you know, it's a natural to sort of also consider the superhero genre within comics as, as it was largely the same folks who were reading it. In superhero narratives, they're very aspirational and they, they particularly in the 60s, always ended sort of with good winning out over evil. But with, in, if you look at Toussaint and the way that story ends, it ends with his, with his death, which is, you know, sort of corresponding to what folks in the African-American community were experiencing in the 60s. Having, I, I'm trying to sort of determine the impact of having within a within a medium that may have had the expectation of ending with a with a happy ending or with heroes triumphant. What's the impact on the audience of of particularly if we're thinking of children and adolescents of a more realistic ending because it's a true story. Yeah. Um, so just just like with my work where it's interdisciplinary, there's a lot that you know I think about. I don't just think about the comic books. I also think about movies. But I, I like your question because, um, you know, I discussed how a lot of scholars talk about many of the superheroes having all these freedoms um, that they didn't have to think about, right? Um, and, you know, comics have become more sophisticated over time in terms of their storytelling. There's always been a, a wide range of, you know, good versus bad when it comes to stories versus when it comes to the arts and the aesthetics and the visuals and the presentation and the composition of all the pages and everything else. Um, but, you know, you have superheroes like Spider-Man. He went through a lot, Peter Parker, you know, like he didn't, everything that he, he's always thinking about how is this gonna affect things? Because he, if, I don't know if he's the first character where that happened, but when I think about Spider-Man and he's from Queens too, <laughs> but when I think about Spider-Man and um, how he lost Uncle Ben, you know, and how that influenced all his decisions moving forward. I think about also kids aren't growing up in this life where everything is perfect, right? Um, they have difficult things that they're experiencing in their, in their life and they might not be able to discuss it. They might not be able to think about it and process it. But if they're able to read about somebody else who's experiencing something, it may help them process it, right? And then maybe they'll have language and terminology because when, when you read comics, you read it over and over and over. And maybe they'll be able to discuss it with their parents a little bit more, you know? So the way that I always bring up comic books and other mediums in my classes is just this discussion about how media is just a form of communication, right? You have the air between us, which is, and, and those who've taken my classes, they've heard me say this over and over, but the air between us is the medium, right? Like, um, yes, we're not using phones, we're not using um, the internet, but if I'm in here and you're there, I'm still trying to get what's in my mind to you. And emotions are difficult to communicate, right? Especially when it's difficult circumstances that you're dealing with. So I can, I can appreciate a, a comic book like this or a comic book like Spider-Man where there's difficult discussions taking place. And, you know, uh, especially when children are not living these beautiful lives all the time where everything is perfect and we're harming them by revealing the real world to them. No, like if they can learn about what really happened and they can learn about it honestly, then they could become prouder, right? And they can see an example of how they should be. So Toussaint's ending was uh, difficult, right? Like it's, it's really sad, but at the same time, there's a reason why people still discuss him today. There's a reason why people go to his, um, his uh, burial site in France, right? There's a reason why France wants to hold on to him and make it seem like he was part of their history as well. Like they're not just making him a villain. There's, it's complicated there, but at the same time, there is a discussion that can happen that can be appreciated. Now, thanks for the question. I'm gonna to try to squeeze two more questions in the remaining time. We have Sabina, then Annalisa. Okay, hi, thank you so much for your presentation. This was really interesting. Um, I just have a, hopefully it's kind of a quicker question. Um, have you ever come across any metaphors for Toussaint or the Haitian revolution in other mainstream comics? Um, so maybe not like an explicit explanation of what happened, but maybe a metaphor or something that you think is a loose reference, um, maybe in like Black Panther or any other Marvel or DC or more major comics? Yeah, I, I think you just said it. I think Black Panther I've heard discuss over and over, multiple articles came out about how Black Panther was 
and Wakanda was similar to Haiti and the Haitian Revolution. And of course, they're speaking about it in the moment of uh, the Haitian Revolution taking place, right? In my article, I discuss why Haiti, you know, has experienced a lot of the struggles that they've experienced over time. You know, like, that's not what my article is about, but my article is about debunking this idea that Haiti is to blame for everything, right? Like only Haiti is to blame. And that's what a lot of authors um, such as Philip Giard and some others have said, like it's the ineptitude and the corruption in Haiti that caused all their problems. And yeah, but just to answer quickly, Black Panther, like that's, that's what I've come across. There's a lot of good articles. Like if you just type in Black Panther, Haitian Revolution, a lot of interesting articles come up. Hello. Um, so based on your background with media production and your research experience, um, can you kind of talk about where do you see the future of comics leading to in terms of are there more comics out there that have pushed back like the Golden Legacies have against this erasure of Black experiences and ancestry in um, our larger society? Thank you. Um, so I go to a lot of different Black comics festivals because I need to go meet with the people that I'm interested in interviewing. And I go to just uh, comics festivals in general too, that where everyone will be at. But the Black comics festivals that I've been at, a lot of people are creating great work. Um, and it's not, just, it's not just about the stories, even the visuals are excellent, they're beautiful. And um, some of them are fictional and they're based off of interesting, you know, just like creative ideas, uh, like the Tuskegee Airs. Um, there's a, a comic that's based off of them and I can't remember the, the, the exact title, like I would have to share it. Um, Strange Tales, so like, there's a lot of different articles, different books that have been published and that are available and they're pushing back. And that's why I mentioned before that the Golden Legacy books, I often see them somewhere at the, goal, at the uh, Black comics festivals where they're always discussing, they're talking about the inspiration from it. Um, so yes, yeah, some of it is historical fiction. Some of it is just all fiction. And, and I see, you know, just the pushing back in the sense of having black characters be a, a big part of the motivation that it's not always an, uh, an educational experience. Sometimes it's just an entertainment experience that they wanna put forth where children can see themselves represented as well. But thank you for the question. Thank you all. I want to thank Dr. Darnell again once again for joining us for this week's um, Brown Bag presentation. Um, please um, look up his classes. Darnell, can you just tell us quickly what course, what graduate course you take, um, you teach? Um, so um, next quarter, I'm teaching responses to culturally diverse literature. Yeah. So next, next, but this class. This quarter, it's, I'm teaching American society, media, and perspectives on social success. But thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great day, and please join us next week for Dr. Gayung Chung.